So if you have your Bibles, if you have your devices, you can go and pull them out. You can turn to, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. While you guys are getting there, let me kind of check in and see. Anybody a fan or anybody to a certain extent aware of that uh, TV show Fear Factor? Again, it came back out originally in 2001, got canceled, got revived, got canceled again, they got revived again. And I think the last time they actually aired an episode was some in t- sometime in 2018. So yeah, some of you may be aware, some of you may not be aware of the TV show. But essentially what they did was they gathered usually individuals, sometimes they had team competitions, whatever it may be, but they gathered people together and their goal was to see who let fear be a factor in their lives. And they would challenge you to different things. So sometimes it'd be like, we're going to make this box and we're going to fill it with snakes and we're going to see who can lie in this box for the longest. And they would eliminate this, whoever stayed in for the shortest amount of time, they'd be out of the show. Or other times they challenge like your, your fear of insects and they'd have like all these fried insects like cockroaches or, or spiders and they'd see like who can overcome their fear and eat one of these insects and challenge each other. If you eat bigger ones or whatever it may be, then you can knock out the other people and so forth. And they always ended on the big kind of like physical challenge where it's like, we're going to fly you in a helicopter and you've got to jump into a lake and, and hit a target yay big or something like that, whatever it may be. So it was always kind of a challenge to see kind of the last one, how, how more physically involved it got. And if you made it to the end, if you won out, if you beat all the other competitors, you were awarded $50,000. So not a bad deal overall. No, no, maybe some of you guys are like, oh, that sounds kind of fun. Like these sound like more fun challenges. If you've seen the show, then you know, I've covered the more PG challenges. That gets way worse than that to the point where like, I don't even want, I don't want to be on the show. Like I'm, I'm not going to be there. You can... You can challenge it if you want. I'm done. I'm going to let fear be a factor in my life. That's okay. I will pass gladly. But the reason why I talk about this is because it kind of begs the question, how much do we let fear be a factor in our lives today? How much does fear play a factor in the way that you make decisions, in the way that you react to things, in the way that you plan how your day is going to go? I think for a lot of us, we really like to say, no, like fear doesn't play a factor in my life. Like it's all sound logic, it's planning, it's well thought out, there's, there's no fear involved whatsoever. But the fact of the matter is that fear for all of us plays a large part in our day-to-day lives. And I start out with all of this because, again, we're continuing our series here, Father of a Nation, as we've been diving into the life of Abraham. We've been looking through the book of Genesis. We went through the first 11 chapters and just saw, again, from Genesis through to the Gospels, we saw that Christ was at the center of it all. And now we dive in a little bit deeper, and, and, and through chapters 12 through 23, we're going to see the life of Abram as he gets transformed into Abraham And we're going to see again how he's just the forefather of faith and the one who points essentially to Christ as well. And so I only started this section of scripture just last week. So there's not a whole lot to recap. But if you did miss that message, again, highly recommend you go back and watch it, whether through YouTubes or whatever ways that you might find it. Um, Definitely worth a good watch here. But we kind of covered, again, just this call of Abraham, that God came down and he reached out and he spoke to Abram. And again, if I say Abraham, Abram, again, we, we know him as Father Abraham eventually as he gets named many chapters away. So we know him more by Abraham than we do Abram. But in this moment, I'm going to do my best to call him Abram, just as his wife is Sarai, but she later gets named Sarah. Get through this whole series. If I keep going back and forth on those, apologize for that. I'm going to try to stick to the names that they have right now with Abram and Sarai. But Abram gets called by God, and, and he comes down and he promises him all these things. And this is a God who, who Abram didn't know yet, right? This is Abram who was his father, a pagan worshiper, and most likely he himself <laughs> worshipped other gods as well. So he meets this new God who promises him all these lavish things that almost to a certain extent seem impossible to achieve. But by faith, Abram accepts those promises. He believes in those promises and he goes and he goes where God commands him to. And eventually he finds himself now in the land of Canaan. And it's here that we kind of get this impression like, oh, Abram is, is this huge man of faith. Like, he must be impressive beyond all belief. Like, how can we ever compare ourselves to Abram? How are we supposed to follow in the footsteps of a father like Abram? Well, in our past today, we get a check into reality just as Abram does as well. And we see that even great moments of faithfulness can be followed by great moments of fear. So again, if you have your Bibles, again, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 12, we mean verse 10. So we'll pick it up here in verse 10, and we'll dive into the passage here this morning. Now, there was a famine in the land, 
So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for there was famine, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, that my life may be spared for your sake. And so the first thing I want to cover here in this first four verses is that Abram makes this crazy plan. And again, I'm calling it crazy now. It doesn't seem so crazy as we kind of dive into it, but we'll show how and why it's crazy as we kind of get into it. But everything going on, everything happening, Abram makes this plan, and we need to dissect it a little bit to see where exactly is he going. So in verse 10, we read the situation that's happening, right? That there's a famine here in the land of Canaan. Now, out of context, that seems normal, right? Famines happen, droughts happen. We're in Houston. I get we're used to that. We go through very heavy times of rain, and we go through very heavy times where it's just completely dry. So again, we're used to droughts. We're used to famines to a certain extent. So out of context, that seems normal. The land is in famine. That's cool. But in context, we have to look at this and see Abram was brought to this land. This is supposed to be the promised land. This is the land that his descendants are supposed to inherit. And as we read through the story, again, Abram has been faithful. Again, beyond faithful. And why is this famine happening? Why does it seem like, is, is Abram being punished? Is, is something happening that we don't understand? Is there something behind the scenes that we didn't quite catch in the first section? I think right away in looking at this, this is a good reminder that God does what he does because God is God. Right? We don't always understand the reasonings why good or bad things happen. But God in sovereignty knows exactly why these things happen. And we need to continue to trust in God more than we trust in ourselves. But as we continue through this passage, we see that that's not what Abram does. Abram does not trust in who God is. So we read here that Abram decides that they're going to go down to Egypt and they're going to sojourn there. To define sojourn for, for those who don't know, it's not a word we use in our vernacular very much here. But to sojourn means that you are to travel to somewhere, to be a wanderer, to work there temporarily, essentially. You're not, you're not planning to be there permanently, but you're just visiting for an extended amount of time. Like the best way I can think of it is if, especially here in Houston, you hear people who, who travel from different cities, different states, and they come to Houston temporarily to work for maybe a year or maybe a couple months, whatever it is. And they take the money that they make and they go back home to support their families or something. Right, that would be people sojourning here in Houston. So that's, that's Abram's plan, right? He wants to go to Egypt. He wants to travel there for a little bit, work there for a little bit, earn some money, eat, feed his family, whatever it may be for a little bit. But eventually his plan is to return back to the land of Canaan. And so again, Abram is doing essentially what everybody would have been doing. Historians look and they see that many people during times of famine would have actually fled to Egypt. Egypt being kind of right on that Nile River always continued to have a flow of water. They were always able to kind of produce crops and famines while still hurting Egypt, hurt Egypt less compared to the land around them. So when things like this happened, people would have fled to Egypt. It would have been normal. Society would have said, that's the wise decision to make. But we continue to see that sometimes while the decision in society's eyes, in culture's eyes, in the people around us' eyes, these would be the wise decisions. That isn't always the wisest decision in God's eyes. That doesn't always have to be the case. They're not always opposite of each other. But in this story, in this particular case, they are. And so in verse 11 and 12, we read that again, uh, as they're entering into Egypt, Abram says to his wife, I know that you're a beautiful woman. Again, very good husbandly thing to say, right? Great starting line. Hey, wife, you are beautiful. Awesome. Highly approve. But then quickly, he goes into why he's telling her this. In verse 12, he tells her, because you are beautiful, the men in Egypt will look at me and know that you are my wife and will want to kill me because of it. And so in 13, he lays his plan out for her. He says, wife, say to them that you are my sister. Right? He tells Sarai to lie for him. Again, a very bad husbandly thing to do, right? Not the example that you should follow here. So tell your wife is beautiful. Don't tell her to lie for you, okay? Pretty clear cut. Not, not too difficult in terms of relationship advice so far. But again, if, if somebody wanted to marry Sarai, the, his plan here is that essentially they would come to him and not see them as, as a husband and wife and thus kill him to make her their wife they would instead visit him as his brother and then they would make arrangements with him because if the father is out of the picture 
then the brother would now be the one responsible for taking care of the sister, for helping to make the arrangements for the sister, of handling the dowry and all those kind of things that kind of happen. So that's, that's his plan and his, his thought process behind it. Now, as a quick side note here, and this isn't really related to the passage, but, but notice that, they, that the Egyptians would rather kill a man than commit adultery. You realize how, how badly they saw adultery even in that culture during that time? That's crazy to think about. They'd rather commit murder than commit adultery. And I used to, I say that mainly because like when I was reading through this and studying this and it came to me, I used to say that of our culture today. That like, oh, our culture looks at adultery in the same way. That like, nobody thinks like, hey, that's a great decision. Go cheat on your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is. Everybody looks at adultery the same way. But I podcast a lot, in case you didn't know, and I heard of one that came out recently. I'm not even going to name it because I don't want to encourage it. But it basically is saying we're looking at the reasons why women cheat and we want to understand those reasons, and we want to give them justification, and why it's almost like it's self-care that they committed adultery. So they're approving of the adultery. It's not even just like we want to look into the reasons why women cheat. We want to look into and understand why they consider adultery self-care. Like, that's nuts. Like, I never thought that our culture and society, that we as followers of Christ, we have very different values than our cultural society, understandably so. But again, I never thought that we would, de- we would see so differently when it came to this idea of adultery. I don't know. Just a random thing. I was talking to somebody else about this, so that's probably why I got put into this message. Again, it doesn't really have to relate to this. It was just something that kind of came to mind when I was talking to them about that podcast. And I was just like such in shock when I heard that kind of thing. But anyway, back into the passage here real quick. Abram fears for his life. And so again, he tells Sarai, call me your brother. Don't call me husband. Call me brother. Right, and so the, uh, again, so they continue through, and, and they enter into the land of Egypt, and that's Abram's plan, right? I am to be your brother, you are to be my sister, and hopefully nobody would bother us. And if somebody does bother us, again, I'm your brother, so I would handle the dowry, I would handle the things, so I could either make the, the requirements to marry you so high that nobody could even enter into this agreement, or I could turn them away because they don't meet my qualifications as a husband. So again. In overall considerations, it's not a terrible plan. Like they could sojourn there. He would be safe because nobody would want to kill him. And at the same time, again, he could reject all the suitors, all the people seeking to marry Sarai. So again, that's his understanding. That's his plan. That, that's what he's laid out for us here. So let's continue in verses 14 through 16. And let's see kind of what happens now. So when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the, women was, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt with her, he being the Pharaoh in this case. And for her sake, Pharaoh dealt with, well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. And so again, we read through Abram's plan in the first four verses. And now in these next three verses, we see ultimately the results of his plan. We see what happens because of his plan here. Right? Things work out according to how Abram essentially said that they would. In verse 14, we read that Abram enters with Sarai. And just as he predicted, the Egyptians found her to be a very beautiful woman. Right? And then in verse 15, we read that not only do the Egyptians find her to be beautiful, but Pharaoh's posse, Pharaoh's princes, Pharaoh's advisors, they all come and they see that, wow, she is a very beautiful woman. And they tell Pharaoh about her. And because of that, Pharaoh takes Sarai to be one of his mistresses. And then finally, in verse 16, we see kind of the results of what all happens now, right? That Pharaoh then comes and he blesses Abraham. He gives him all kinds of things. He gives him sheep, oxen, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. Again, to kind of break all this down so we can understand how rich this guy just got because of what Pharaoh did. Sheep would have been considered textiles because of their wool. They also would have been considered sources of food and even sacrifices at times. Oxen, they would have been like trucks for us. They were work animals. They plowed. They got jobs done. Right For donkeys, whether male or females, again, one they would mate when you have male and female, so you'd get more. But just donkeys in general, they were seen as like luxury traveling things. Right, These would be our BMWs, our Mercedes, our Lexus, our, our fancy cars. That would have been a donkey for them. And then camels, this would have been exotic travel. This would be like our Ferraris, our Rolls Royces, if I can say it, Rolls Royces, if I can say that properly. Like our super luxury, super, you don't see those cars very often. They're they're things that you like, oh, I'm going to rent that for prom, or I'm going to get that for a special night out. That's the kind of travel the camels would have been. And so again, all these things, he now owns, he's just inherited a fleet of vehicles, 
whether to travel for fun, whether to travel in luxury, or whether to travel in order to accomplish work. He has so much money that he's been given here. But have you ever had a plan that worked more well than you really wanted it to? Like it was too good of a plan and you were like, I I, I didn't expect it to go so well. Like the first thing that came to mind for me was Jurassic Park, the very, very first one. Right? They, they had this plan to create dinosaurs, and they create it and turn it into a theme park. And then all of a sudden, the dinosaurs revolt, and they break free, and now they're, they're trying to kill everybody on the island. And one of the characters, he says this line that has just been so encapsulated in our society. He says, you scientists spent so much time thinking whether you could do something that you didn't even think about whether you should do it. Right? You spent so much time thinking, can we create dinosaurs, that they never thought and paused to say, Should we create dinosaurs? And I think that applies to us here with Abram. He spent so much time thinking, what could happen to me? What could could be the best way that I could get out of this? That he never paused and thought, should I be doing this? Should I be lying about my wife? Should I be putting her in this situation? Should I be putting her in harm at the same time to sacrifice or to save myself, essentially? So Abram tells everybody that Sarai is not his wife, but his sister. And the one person who could buy out anything, the one person who doesn't even need really permission to ask, is the one who comes and takes Sarai. Right? Pharaoh comes, and Pharaoh, again, has all the money in the world. He is the ruler of Egypt. He is fleeing to this land of Egypt to survive, and Pharaoh has all of it. And so he gives him whatever it is that he wants. And again, Pharaoh is the most powerful man in the land. So there's no way that you could tell him that he's not qualified to be Sarai's wife. And so his plan works, but it works too well. He finds the best suitor in the entire land to have taken his wife. And so what I want to do here before we move on is pause and see like, what would happen if the story ended right here? Like what if this was the end of the Bible? Like what will be the happily ever after essentially? Right, if we looked at this, Sarai would now go live with Pharaoh, right? And Abram, her quote-unquote brother, like he would go back home because you don't keep the brother. You have the wife now. Like the brother eventually goes back home. So now Abram goes back to the land of Canaan alone. And his promise to have descendants can't be fulfilled because how do you have descendants without a mother? The promises of God that have been given essentially are, are threatened, if I can even say it that way. That God's plan is threatened because of what Abram has done. Because of Abram's lack of faith, because of his response in fear, he has put God's promises at threat. And so again, Sarai is set to be with Abram, or Sarai is set to be with Pharaoh, and Abram is scheduled to go home. That's what should be happening right now. And so we pick it up and we finish it off here in verses 17 to 20. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Adam's wife, Abram's wife, excuse me. So when Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him. And they sent him away with his wife and all that they had. So the last thing that I want to go into here is God's plan. Like what happens when God steps in, when God comes in and reveals the way he wants things to be done and ultimately how he fixes Abram's, I'm going to say it bluntly, but just stupid plan. How does he fix Abram's plan? See, in verse 17, we see right away God gets to work and he afflicts Pharaoh and his entire household with great plagues. Now, we don't know exactly what these plagues would have been. Some scholars like to argue that like, oh, it must have been some kind of uh, affliction that wouldn't have allowed Pharaoh to sleep with Sarai. Possible? I don't know. I think they're trying to, to conserve and to, to preserve Sarai. But again, we have no idea what this plague would have been. All we know is that the plague was somehow linked to Sarai. So in my brain, the way I thought of it, I thought it'd be funny if there was like they got allergies. Every time that she entered a room, everybody just started sneezing. They're like, it's got to be Sarai. Like, why are we all sneezing? Every time she walks into the room, we just start dying of allergies. So something's got to be up with Sarai, right? Maybe it's because we're here in Houston. Maybe it's because we're dealing with allergies. I don't know. That's just kind of how my brain processed it. But in verse 18 here, Pharaoh comes and he confronts Abram. And he asks him, like, why have you done this to me? Why have you cursed me? Why did you lie to me and tell me that she was not your wife? And he pushes in verse 19. He says, why did you say specifically that she is my sister? It's because you told me that she is your sister that I took her for my wife. 
But because you have lied to me and you've told me these things, take your wife and go, get out of here. In fact, moreover, he tells in verse 20, he commands all of his men, basically. It's, we don't exactly hear the command, but you can tell. He tells them, don't touch Abram. Get them out of here. Escort them out of here. Protect them. Make sure they leave the land safely and that they leave with everything that I've given to them. Here's probably the biggest wow moment that I had when I was reading through this. In this moment, in these three verses, Pharaoh has acted more honorably than Abram has. Abram, our our hero, our father of a nation, the person who is the father of faith, acts less honorably, acts more disgraceful than Pharaoh. Pharaoh who doesn't have a relationship with God. Pharaoh who doesn't have promises and blessings from God. Pharaoh who doesn't know God whatsoever acts more honorably than Abram does. Again, Abram's plan was to lie about his wife. And it completely backfires on him in the most worst possible way that you could think of. The one person, again, who could manage and to overcome every objection that Abram had was Pharaoh. And he's the one that comes for Sarai. And again, it's in verse 18, 19, and 20 that we see that Pharaoh is the one who responds in the best way possible. And this is all because of what God has commanded, of what God has done. That he afflicts Pharaoh and convicts his heart and challenges him. And, and Abram is able to leave, not only with his wife, which he shouldn't have to begin with, but he leaves with more, with all of these blessings of oxen, of donkeys, of servants, of camels. So this is God's amazing plan in action. That while Abram failed so hard, God comes in and he blesses him anyway. For somebody who responded so faithfully in the first nine verses, we see him act again completely disgracefully in this back half of the chapter. But nonetheless, the lesson we learn from this is that God is faithful. That no matter how unfaithful, no matter how far Abram sins, God is faithful. So this brings us to the end. I kind of want to just look at a couple big major lessons that we can pull away from this passage. First thing I think we can learn from this is that the decisions we make today matter. And what I mean by that is that our repercussions of our actions come back to us, whether today, whether tomorrow, whether a year from now, the things that we do today have, act- have repercussions for our actions. This kind of echoes kind of that theory that they talk about the butterfly effect. Again, you've may seen movies over it, whatever it is. They talk about how the butterfly flaps its wings and because of that motion several weeks from now, there could have been a tornado that happened over here. I'm not completely advocating for the theory, But again, I'm advocating that what we do today causes things to happen down the line. Again, thinking back to this very situation, again, remember, we just went over that that Abram left with all the blessed things, right? That he left with the donkeys and the camels and the servants and everything like that. But there's one servant in particular that he left with. He left with Hagar. Hagar was an Egyptian servant. And if you know your Bible, if you've been in the church world, then you know the name Hagar. But for us, if you don't know, if you're unfamiliar, in chapter 16, we come across Hagar. And, and Sarai, again, she's supposed to have kids with Abram, but they've been trying and trying and trying. And it's not like they tried for a year. They were trying for decades, and they weren't able to have a kid. And so Sarai comes, and she tells her husband, hey, go sleep with, uh, with uh, Hagar, excuse me. Abram, go sleep with Hagar, and through her, you will now produce an offspring. And so he does so. And because of that action, he not only causes turmoil within his own family, because Sarai now starts to despise Hagar, but he causes turmoil within the nation. Because later on, his future son Isaac, his nation continues to have conflicts with with Hagar's son Ishmael. They have conflicts. So not only has he caused turmoil between his family, he's caused turmoil between two different nations. And arguably, this is where Islam started from. So not only does he cause conflict between his two nations, he spawned off an entirely false religion. All because he decided in one day to sojourn in Egypt. Again, I'm not going to say that the decision you make today will go and spawn off a whole new religion. I'm not going to make that claim. I don't know what will happen. All I know is that when we act outside of the faithfulness of God, that we act outside of the sovereignty of God, that we don't depend on him first and foremost. I don't know what that action looks like. I don't know what the consequences of those actions will be. All I know is, again, as we continue to see that God is faithful, that God is trustworthy and sovereign, we should make our actions in faith to that God. And that leads me kind of to the second thing that we learn, that when we make plans, again, we need to consult God first. 
Now, the second thing we see here is that when we make plans, we need to learn to consult God. That it isn't specifically spelled out for us, but it's not told that he did it. That Abram, when he made his decision to sojourn in Egypt, he didn't seek God's counsel. He didn't ask God, hey, there's a famine going on. What is it that I should do? No, Abram makes his decision and goes to Egypt on his own. Again, I already covered, we don't know why God does what he does. For all we know, God may have called this famine to happen to the land of Canaan as a way to get the Canaanites out of the land. He may have brought this famine as a way to bless Abram, but Abram didn't even know it, and he left the blessing behind. Again, we don't know. That's all just made up. We have no idea. All we know is, again, if we have a God that we can trust, if we have a God that we know is sovereign, if we have a God that we know is good, anytime we plan outside of that God, we are planning to fail. And so the final thing that I think we pick up from this passage is that it should give us confidence in God's promises. And ultimately, it gives us confidence in God's salvation. That again, God made several big plans and promises to Abram at the very beginning of this chapter. And regardless of what Abram has done, even to this point of being so unfaithful, of of again, quote unquote, threatening God's plan, God still remains faithful to Abram and he follows through and he makes way for his promises to be fulfilled. And that same thing is true for us today. Right, that God's plan and God's promise is that when we place our hope, our trust, and our faith in Jesus, that we are made righteous and we are given eternal life. That is God's plan. There are no loose ends to that. There are no catches or things to, to trick you up. There's no un- underlining language that you have to read. There. There's no fine print that contradicts any of that. I would say that you could take that to the bank, but banks are failing right now, so who knows? Instead, take your promises to God. Take your promises to the promise maker and the promise keeper, the one who has been sovereign and good from the very beginning. There's nowhere else and no one else I would rather have a promise from than from God. And God's promise to us is his son. And through his son, we have eternal life. And so I don't know if that's where you are right now. I don't know wherever it is that you are. God sees us in our sinfulness. And he still continues to send Christ on the cross for us. That again, even in this story, Abram went off the rails. He went off the deep end. And easily, God could have just punished him, or God could have started new. Again, we've read through the story so far, and we've seen how God has restarted a handful of times. But he's continued to make promises why he wouldn't do that. Easily, God could have said, well, Abram, you had your shot. I'm going to go find somebody else. But instead, God continues to keep his promise to Abram. So for us today, did God send Christ to the cross because we're supposed to be very good? No. Did God send Christ to the cross because of how much we've done for him and and all the things that we're able to accomplish here in church? No. Did God send Christ to the cross because of how much potential we may have to do great things? No. God sent Christ to the cross for one thing and one thing only because he loves us. Again, this tells us so much more about God character than it does tell us about our own. That there's nothing specifically special about each and every one of us. But there is something special about our God, our Father, our Savior. And so again, God sent his son to die on the cross. That anyone who would confess with their mouth and believe in their hearts would have eternal life. That promise, again, is completely one-sided. That there is nothing you can do and nothing that can separate us from God. And so my hope for you this morning is that you would believe in that promise. My hope is that you would trust in that promise, and my hope is that you would share that promise with the world. And so again, if that's you this morning, if that's the first time that you want to make that decision, again, we always want to continue to partner with you. If you've made that decision for the first time, again, I'll be up front here. I'd love to respond with you and to to explain what that type of decision means. Or if, again, if you've been in a position where you feel like you strayed away from God and and you'd like to recommit yourself, then again, this is you responding to the promise that God made from the beginning. And no matter how far or how much you may have sinned, God continues to be faithful to you and he would love to receive you back into his flock. So I'd love to spend time to counsel and to see, again, how can you recommit your life to God? Again, our, our mission here at West Houston is always to continue to grow our hearts for Jesus, his people, and his world. And that always takes that first step of faith, to put your faith in who God is and the promises that he has and his son that has come to save us. So again, my hope and prayer is that you would respond to that promise, trust in that promise, and share that promise this morning. So with that, let me pray for us, and we'll respond here in song this morning. 
Father, again, we thank you just for your son. We thank you for Christ on the cross. The whole reason we gather here, the whole reason we're able to do the things that we are able to do is because you have been faithful from the very beginning. And God, we pray that you would continue to allow us just to respond to that. Where we would resonate with who it is that you are and continue to grow in the grace that you have given to us. And so God, as we continue through our morning here, as we continue through our days, again, continue to allow us just to say yes to you. To say yes to your promises. To say yes to your faithfulness. And again, just continue to pursue you with everything that we are. And so God, I pray that you would just soften hearts where they need to be that you would soften minds, that you would just again open us up and allow us to dive deeper into who it is that you are and who you want us to be. So we thank you, we do these things, and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen.